where humans do this. Mm -hmm. The law society does this. Lawyers are very effective at, at, at creating a, a monopoly in, in, in that kind of labor, so they bid up their wages. Mm -hmm. And all of this is about relative status as well, in a sense. I mean, not to say that you, you can exchange different kinds of labor willy-nilly, mm -hmm. but, but if you reject the notion that, that wage comes from, from marginal productivity of labor, which you have to do if you reject the notion that capital profit comes from marginal productivity yeah. of capital. I, I do reject that notion. Still, yeah, me too. But you're still yeah. going to, to explain where they come from. And where wage differences come from. Yeah, and where mm -hmm. differential profits come from. Uh, right. And I was, that's what I was suggesting that you were suggesting, was it could be traced to status. Like, status is a, is a common... What's the constant here? Or is it all just capitalism? And that's it. Um... Your point was that, okay, how do we explain differences in wages and differences in profits? Yeah. And your idea was this derives from status thinking? or The idea of the idea of wanting to have status, wanting to have more stuff? Well, differential capture of value by different, different groups of actors on a value chain. So, mm -hmm. you know, lots of different kinds of labor are involved in producing a product like an iPhone or something. Right. Away from the Chinese people who made it Right. If you think their wages are not proportional to their contributions to each product, right. then clearly they're not. they're not. Yeah. Then there must be some other explanation. It's to do with their ability to, to like sabotage the production of that product by by withdrawing their labour, and that's to do with the relative amount of competition at each point on the chain. And is that to do? Can that be traced to, to status? Um, but before you get to this last point, <laughs> before you get to this last point, maybe the way you express it is. Um, wouldn't quite agree with, but in essence, I would agree with the following point. Um, you said difference in... We're getting off into a different topic here, but maybe we should talk about it a little more later. Let me just make one little point, yeah? Um, you had pointed out how the amount of money people make doesn't is not a factor of how much they contribute to a certain product. Yeah? There's lots of examples that show that would be ridiculous. So the example you had, uh, let's say children working in China, you know, how long to build an entire, or to make a, a shoe, the money that the lawyers make just by making a phone call. Clearly, that's not the point. The other, the point is, wages are determined by a wild competition. Yeah? Everybody tries to get as much for their work as possible, and capitalists try to pay as little as possible. And depending on the power relations, you get a whole different set of wages. Yeah? Throughout the world, what workers earn in one country might be different from what they earn in another country. What workers in one sector earn might be different from workers in another sector. Um, the one point I would, I would emphasize about that is, well, the first point that we agree upon, it emphasizes how little production or this process of production has anything to do with satisfying the needs of these people. Nothing to do with them. The point is to pay as little as possible in order to get as high a price on the other end. Where or what determines a different set of wages is a wild antagonistic competition between producers. That's really the explanation. That's where that comes from. Your point is, does that come from status? I would simply say no. I think that that's all you need in order to explain that. Is let's say that that hard economic reality. That's really a reason to criticize capitalism. Really to condemn it. To say what an irrational uh, mode of production in which what people have from it is determined by competition, by how much they can, let's say, uh, screw the other guy, would be the moralistic way of saying it. Yeah. Any other questions before I move on to the idea of anti-consumerism? Okay, third point. As I said at the beginning, there's really no disagreement about the fact that we live in a, in a time when everything revolves around consumers. Yeah? This is the common mistake that everybody makes. Disagreements are about whether that's a good, a good or a bad thing, and nowadays it seems that the majority thinks, or let's say a growing majority of people think that's a bad thing. Critique of consumption or critics of consumerism are certainly more and more popular. And at first sight, I think, how can you criticize consumption? The one thing they would criticize about capitalism is consumption. 
And how is that possible? The only purpose of production, the only rational purpose of production at all would be consumption, the fact that people can consume stuff. The, the only rational point to produce something is to be able to consume it later, yeah? or to produce things that can produce other things that you can consume. So these people criticize consumption. It's first of all strange. Now one could say they're not just criticizing consumption per se. They're criticizing the kind of consumption that you can find in this society, the kind of consumption you find in a modern market economy. What does that look like? What does this critique look like? Um, there's lots of different examples, and for me, the most representative group is a, is a group called Adbusters. I'm not sure if anybody's ever heard of that. They uh, organize something called Buy Nothing Day once a year, and that's not the only thing they do. That's more a symbolic issue. Buy Nothing Day is one day a year, nobody should buy anything. You know? Stop consuming. Generally, their theory is that the problems of, let's say, the modern world, environmental destruction, poverty in the third world, overwork, stress uh, in the first world, also poverty in the first world, all of this is due to overconsumption, to massive consumption, especially in North America, also in Western Europe. Uh, one advertisement uh, that I saw for this Buy Nothing Day said, one-fifth of the world's richest people, so these would be the people in North America, is responsible for 86% of consumption, leaving only 14% to the other four-fifths of the population. So the idea is because we, in the quotation marks, consume so much stuff, we leave the people in the third world so little. Because these people consume so much, these people have so little. Because these people throw away so much stuff, the others have so little. Let me say something about this first basic argument. Because in a certain sense, this covers a whole range of anti-consumerism, this basic idea. Because the rich countries consume so much, the others have so little. First point I want to make is, this fact, yeah, let's say this gap between a rich and poor, is not a matter of how much people in the first world consume. It's a reflection of the purpose of production. If people in the first world stopped buying things, stopped consuming stuff, the stuff doesn't get shipped to Africa. Starving people in Africa wouldn't get one more thing to eat if people in the first world stopped eating or started eating less. The poverty of people in the third world doesn't come from the fact that there's not enough and one group is eating too much of it. Poverty in the third world comes from the fact that these people have no money. And because they have no money, they can't get a hold of the goods that would even be available there. Their poverty, their inability to consume, is not because of consumption in the first world. It's because of the purpose of production everywhere. If they're not useful for profit, they don't get any money. And if they don't have any money, they don't get any goods. That's the explanation for poverty. It's the basic, simple explanation for poverty in the third world. They're excluded from the things they need and can only get a hold of those goods if they have money. But nothing changes about that if people in the first world consume less. In fact, because that's the, because that's the case, because these people's livelihood is dependent upon their usefulness or profit, that's why it's even the case that, let's say, all of us here stopped buying, and, uh, stopped buying and consuming goods or started consuming a lot less. Not only would not get any better for these people, in a lot of cases, it even gets worse. Think of the famous uh, argument, yeah, but if people in the first world start consuming, well, then it's not profitable for companies, so they won't hire people in the third world, so these people won't have any jobs at all, so they won't have anything to consume. You can't want that, can you? Well, what is that a reflection of? Again, it's a reflection of the fact that their livelihood is dependent on their usefulness for profit. Yeah, they're dependent on companies making profits. If companies can't make profits because people here don't consume so much, well, then these people have no economic significance at all. Again, the general point is the poverty of these people is not a, pro uh, a result of consumption in the first world. It's a result of the purpose of production in all parts of the world. 
that's the really, we could say, 90% of the ideology of anti-consumerism. Let's say 50%. The other 50% is because we in the first world consume so much, we destroy the environment. The planet simply can't take so much consumption. Can't take the amount of waste that's thrown out every year. Can't take the fact that products are sent back and forth across the globe on ships, on planes. The amount of CO2 that's... Um, burned off in production and transportation. If the whole world consumed like that, uh, the planet would simply be destroyed. My critique of that idea is, again, the destruction of the environment is not a result of consumption per se. There's no reason why people consuming stuff, why people in producing and consuming stuff should necessarily stand in contrast to the interest in preserving the environment. There's no reason why that should imply the destruction of the environment. If production in the first world destroys the environment, then it's not because of, uh, of consumption, but because of the purpose of production. That consists in turning money into more money. What does that mean? That means production has to be cheap. That means that things need to be produced, parts of different products need to be produced in the places they get produced cheapest. That means sending goods from one corner to the globe and back again, transporting them back and forth until it all gets together because labor is cheaper here for certain things, labor is cheaper there for other things. One ex that's one example. Another example, often, um, is people refer to the enormous amount of waste, the enormous amount of stuff that gets thrown out every year. Well, if you remember back to what I said about an hour ago, this uh, issue of planned obsolescence. Why is it that Computers, as soon as there's a slightly better computer on the market, you don't change the microchip, you throw out the whole computer and you buy a new product. That's not because people are materialists, because people want to get hold of goods. That's because of the business calculation, which dictates the following. Well, you could, of course, just change the microchip, but much more money could be made if it's impossible to repair it and buy a new computer. Now, that's really the source of industrial waste. Something like planned obsolescence. Waste is cheaper. Because production is cheap, this also means using the environment as a cheap trash can. All kinds of different examples. Any kind of environmental, um, environmental precautions. It just costs too much money. That's not a result of consumption, people wanting to have stuff. That's a result of companies wanting to produce cheap and sell expensive. It's that purpose of production that creates this environmental destruction, not people just wanting to have stuff. Finally, one last point. The, the idea about, let's say, the idea at the heart of the anti-consumerist uh, anti ideology is something I've referred to actually throughout the talk. And that is, they ask the question, why do people consume so much stuff? Why? It's because they're so materialistic. People are just so materialistic. They want more and more stuff. And because people want more and more and more stuff, they destroy the environment. People are so well fed. Yeah, they're not poor. They have everything that they need and more, consuming all kinds of stuff. The fact that their lives revolve around shopping yeah, is proof of the fact of how, of how well off they are. Well, what I wanted to show when I was talking about the different marketing strategies is that the way that consumers think when they go and buy is not a reflection of how well the materialism is served, of how well off they are. Every argument for consumers to buy and the way consumers think themselves is a reflection of their poverty. Think about it again. What are the advertisements for sales? It's cheap, a reflection of their poverty, high quality, a reflection of the fact that normally they don't get good stuff. No time? Buy this product. Um, you have a headache and you certainly can't be sick tomorrow? Buy this product. And when people say, I'm a clever consumer, it's not because they say, I managed to fulfill my needs great, uh, in a fantastic way and get all the stuff I need. Really, consumer pride is, I might not have a lot of stuff, or I might not have a lot of money, but I can make that money go a long way. Consumers' pride has to do with their skills in budgeting uh, their limited resources, their skills in managing their own poverty. 
that kind of materialism isn't a reflection of wealth, certainly not of too much wealth, and not even of materialism. That's a reflection of poverty. That's a reflection of the fact that people know that they have to deal with limited resources, don't criticize it, but develop a pride in their success in doing that. Another example of that, I said at the beginning, shopping is uh, one of the best, or let's say most popular hobbies nowadays. People love to go shopping. This is also usually taken as proof of the fact of how materialistic this society is. Well, why do people enjoy shopping so much? First of all, I'm going to say it's a strange thing. The act of getting a hold of something is more interesting than the product itself. Yeah, the act of going out and actually purchasing something is, let's say, the primary enjoyment. And what you actually get and what you do with the product is a secondary enjoyment. First of all, think, what a strange world. But there's a reason for that. I think that the reason for that, that people enjoy this act of purchase so much, is precisely the fact that they're normally excluded from these things. The really, the joy consists in overcoming an exclusion, overcoming the fact that normally I'd be excluded from these products. This time, I think I'm going to spoil myself. And for a lot of people, it's really also the idea of just fantasizing about the things that you could have. That's window shopping. Walking along and saying, hmm, this is something I could have. Let me imagine myself having that. These are all reflections on the fact that they're excluded from these goods normally. The fact that getting a hold of these goods is not something that's self-evident, obvious, boring, even, um, even bothersome. You, know? you actually have to go get it. It's the whole enjoyment. Think about how, people, how much people enjoy that exception to the rule, getting to get a hold of something. Enjoying the fact that they're not excluded, but now I have access to something. So again, this thing, shopping as a hobby, normally taken to be a sign of excessive materialism. My claim is, it's in fact a reflection of their poverty. Maybe one more point. Take the other proof for excessive materialism. People define who they are by what they buy. Buying lots and lots of stuff shows what a great person you are. Shows how successful you are, how skillful you are. To me, it seems clear this interest in getting hold of lots and lots of goods is not simply the interest in having stuff, but really compensating for your normal everyday life. Going out and getting lots and lots of stuff, I'm in control now. I can actually buy something I want. It's not the boss telling me what to do. It's not other people telling me what to do all the time. That's what I have in my workaday life. Now it's the weekend. Now it's time to go out and, let's say, exercise my freedom. It's time to really go out and show that I'm the one in control. And even more important, going out and proving to others that I'm in control. Proving to others what a successful person I am. These are all different, let's say, false ways of coping with the fact that this mode of production, this economy, is not all about them. It's about taking advantage of them. Because of that fact, because consumption isn't the problem, Let's say consumerism isn't the problem. Consumption isn't the cause of environmental destruction. It's also not the cause of poverty in the third world. That's why the most popular anti-consumerist proposals um, are so wrong-headed, why they're a mistake. I already pointed out why buying less doesn't help those who have nothing. Their poverty doesn't come from a lack of stuff, it's a lack of money. But this argument is also extraordinarily submissive and modest. Think about what counts as overconsumption. Pretty much everything beyond just having, let's say, a warm roof or a warm house, a roof over your head, uh, food and drink. Everything beyond that is excessive. They don't all measure, let's say, a good standard of living according to the possibilities of production, according to productive forces, but according to what is a minimum. Satisfied materialism is people just getting by. For me, that's far too little. Second of all, most important, or important point. Buy nothing day. day. Or fair trade. Or boycotts. Very common anti-consumerist proposals. By going out and not buying things. By buying more consciously. We force companies to produce things 
that we want. We force companies to not destroy the environment. We force companies to um, pay their workers more. I don't really want to go into the point about whether all these means uh, or whether all these methods are effective or not. I don't think that they are. But more important than that, think about how absurd that is. In order for production to serve the needs of consumers, in order for production to not ruin the people that produce, in order for production to not ruin the environment, it's necessary to fight against the producers. It's necessary for consumers to stand up and resist, to fight back against the producers. What a strange thing. In this society, production and consumption don't go hand in hand. It's not the case that you organize the production in such a way that it satisfies the consumers and doesn't destroy the basis of all life. Rather, in order for, con uh, for production to be rational at all, or let's say to treat its producers a little better or not destroy the environment, you need to do something like a strike. What that reflects is the antagonism at the heart of this mode of production. Production <coughs> and consumption are in conflict with each other. In order for production to be rational, consumers have to abstain from consuming. They have to stand up and fight against the producers. And this conflict, which is at the heart of the market economy, the capitalist system of production, this conflict between production and consumption isn't changed at all by not buying something. It doesn't get changed at all by buying less. That antagonism remains in place. Therefore, also the reasons for poverty of people, not only in the third world, also in the first world, and the destruction of the environment. Are there any questions, comments, objections? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Uh -huh. I'd like to address one of the first points that you were talking for my business to, to make profits for me. I, I do want money out of this so that I can fulfill my own needs. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't see any problem in companies wanting to maximize the profit. Uh, I see uh, the problem as a more basic one, more fundamental. A problem related not to how uh, individuals uh, run their companies, but how the system, the capitalist economic system, is, is, is built and what uh, ideas it, it is built upon. Uh, you see, the economic system allows companies to take control, to take control uh, uh, of resources that are uh, necessary for a whole population, meaning that, that companies uh, are the ones who uh, de facto control society as to uh, how much people uh, have uh, to, uh, to use, uh, whether we talk money or Companies become powerful. There is no, there is no, there is this freedom of, of ownership, uh, economic freedom in capitalism. And just as you pointed out, that freedom, uh, consumers' freedom, is, is actually false freedom. It's, it's more, uh, it's more like it, and, uh, it, it blocks actually, it hinders the, the ability to, to think independently outside the framework of uh, the companies uh, wanting to, to to profit on your needs and exploit your needs. And I think the same goes for the economic freedom. Economic freedom allows companies to take hold uh, of, of uh, resources and services that should be uh, available to all people. So you cannot change the situation by changing the way that companies are run or by forcing individuals to open shops and start companies only to fulfill the needs of others. I believe that you, you need to have a completely uh, different system, an economic system that, that uh, doesn't leave uh, the distribution of well, uh, to the magic hand of, of Adam Smith, to the invisible hand, or to the companies to decide the destiny of, of millions or even billions of people. Mm -hmm. uh, what kind of alternative would you propose uh, in order to uh, secure the distribution, a fair distribution of wealth, instead of just maximizing the production? With 
without uh, any uh, yeah, without any way any any, any way of securing uh, people's goods. Um. There wasn't any. I didn't. I didn't see any alternative to making mm -hmm. speech anyway. Now I, I, I did read your background and see that you were writing for this Marxist uh, quality paper. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, let me say two things. Uh, the first thing is, uh, the first thing you talked about, that you said um, you don't agree with the idea of, let's say, forcing individuals to, let's say, be more, um, be more moral in their production or be more ethical. It's a problem connected with the capitalist system. I couldn't agree more. I didn't say that. Oh. I didn't say that, that, that people shouldn't be more moral or ethical oh. in their production. That's another question. I just said that the basic problem is not with I couldn't agree more. In, I hope I wasn't misunderstood. <laughs> Let me put it that way. I mean, first of all, I'll say it's a misunderstanding. I couldn't agree more. My purpose is not to say that um, whether capitalists are unethical or not, it doesn't matter. The problem is that they're in control of the means of production. Their success is the thing that everything else is dependent upon. And their success means ruining others. I don't want to talk about the individuals. I want to talk about that purpose of production, taking money and turning it into more money. Yeah, that's the problem. 100% agreement with you. Yeah, I also agree that if you want to get rid of the problems that are often, let's say, rid of the unpleasant circumstances that are often attributed to uh, consumerism, yeah, environmental destruction, widespread poverty, overwork, yeah, there's... Um, the only thing to do is to change the entire purpose of production. Yeah. yeah, change the purpose of production so that it serves people's needs. I didn't say that. You wouldn't say that. No. To organize production so that it doesn't serve profit, no. but to my, my serve people's needs. You have to uh, differentiate between uh, production and private uh, poverty of people. Because private poverty is the Let's see. Let's see. First of all, yeah, I would agree. It's not just uh, it just not not just an economic issue. It's also a political issue. You mentioned a few different things. The first thing was this basic principle of private ownership. It's true. Most people praise that private ownership. That's the reason that this is a great system. You pointed out what private ownership first of all means is exclusion of others from these means regardless of whether they need them or not. So you mentioned the sun or water. Absolutely basic commodity. Everybody needs it. 
private ownership over it, making that good a commodity, private property in that water, means excluding other people from it. Yeah, that's the principle of private property. That's really the irrationality of private property. Maybe we could even agree with me if I said, and that principle is never rational, regardless for what. Private property, this exclusion of other people from goods that they need, is the foundation of the system. That's why it needs to be criticized. It was also the, really the point I wanted to make in the first point of my talk, is to say, what is the basis of modern poverty? Why is it that people can't get a hold of the wealth that they need? Well, the reason is because of the form that wealth takes. It's private property. It doesn't matter whether they need it or not. It's a matter of who owns it. And if they don't have the means in order to acquire ownership of that money, then they're excluded from it. So, what I mean by altering the purpose of production, what I mean by that is actually, I'm surprised that you say that's not fundamental. <laughs> what I would say is, altering the purpose of production would mean no longer, let's say, having private property as the wealth, let's say the form of wealth in the society, where the purpose is accumulating more and more private property. Now, the purpose would be, should be really simple. Determining a people's needs, determining the people's desires, organizing the means of production in a way that satisfies everyone, minimizing work, etc., etc. Kind of useless to talk about this because, first of all, I need to get people to understand where the problems in this society come from. And that would get to my point about the alternative. I think that you and me might agree that we have, let's say, a rather radical critique of the market economy. Yeah. The point is, uh, you probably noticed yourself, nobody else thinks that way. Very few people do. That's why my alternative, it's really not an alternative at all, go to other people and explain to them why the problems that they might see everywhere, poverty, overwork, is not because of greedy companies, also not because of excessive materialism, but because of the very basis of this economy, something like private property. That's why I'd say that's, first of all, my entire alternative. If I can get other people to agree to that, if I can get other people to say, wow, you know what, you're right. All these ugly things don't come from immorality, a lack of ethics. They don't come from greedy companies. Really, they come from the, uh, the nature of private property, of this kind of wealth, and from the purpose of production, the accumulation of private property. Yeah, if I could have people that far, there's no worry about discussing alternatives. But until that point, it just doesn't make sense. Uh, I don't have an alternative. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, I uh, accept him as a real price that the uh, main uh, point of the uh, argument was that uh, uh, the economy runs uh, only because people earn money so they can use money and so production can proceed. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it will fall apart. Mm -hmm. Machines were taking over their people's ability to pay and buy products. Uh, so people, uh, machines took that work, so they got fired, so they couldn't earn money to pay for stuff. So the economy fell apart, and we had the most severe. Uh, economic 
economic uh, breakdown in the history. You're all uh, aware of it, right? Uh, I mean, the Great Depression. Yeah, the Great uh, the Depression. And had it, in fact. Uh, what saved the economy made, uh, the world economy made in the World War II, because that made the uh, uh, people usable once again. There are uh, lots of uh, different words. Monetary crisis, because their main idea, this uh, group in North America, uh, was that uh, is that it's not just the market economy that's the problem. It's a very monetary crisis system, because there's no way that uh, that uh, you can save this price the price system economics. This, there's no there's no way to save the price system system the price system economics. Because, well, because it's complex with fiscal laws, basically. Because you can't have prices without losing more and more and more. So, inevitable, it will come down. Whatever we do about it, we can do nothing about it, uh, or we can try to enact an alternative to the price system. But whatever we do about it, the prices will come down. That's the that main reason for continuing this, uh, continuing this, uh, this kind of uh, science. Mm -hmm. Post scarcity. Post scarcity. Post scarcity. Uh, no, I'm not familiar with it. No. Um, but, but maybe one point about that. Y you were saying. The ultimate purpose of this theory is to say, at some point, this thing has got to collapse. Yes, no matter what. No matter if it's, if it's China, not the soil in the United States, or Denmark, or China, the price system will come down. Mm -hmm. or maybe worldwide. That's, I, maybe it's happening now. Yeah. Um, well, I, I don't really have an opinion on that. On the one hand, I would say, probably not. <laughs> This is held up. Uh, this is a system held up by much more than, let's say, a certain price system. It's held up by lots of means of force. Yeah, but something about the holds up the price system. Uh, right, exactly. <laughs> you could say it that way. And I would warn against a certain kind of argumentation by saying because the system is bound to fail, that's why it deserves criticism. I'm not saying that. Okay, good. <laughs> The reason I was thinking about it is it's a very common argument to say, look, this is a non-sustainable system. It's going to collapse at some point. Yeah. I think that the, if it's uh, going to come down to collapse, no matter what, I think that's an argument to try to find a solution for it before the problem becomes so severe that, the, that the, our future actually becomes so bleak that it's uh -huh. much worse, much worse than Um, yeah, I think one of the problems, I, I, maybe I'd have to take a look at it more, but I don't think I'd agree with the premises. I can't understand why the price system has just collapsed. But let's say, apart from that, it's bad enough now. Yes. <laughs> Regardless of whether the system itself has contradictions, whether it might run for 100 years or, or 50 years, regardless of whether the system can't function or not, the way it's functioning now, and it's functioning very well, uh, stands in contradiction to most people's interests. That would be a reason to criticize the system. Not because it might collapse, but because there's a contradiction, a necessary one, between the functioning of the system, of this economic system, of the market economy, the price system, and most people's basic, or most people's material interests. Go ahead. Yeah, I think that there are two arguments for pursuing this uh, kind of research. One is to, the system, if it's true, if, if the prices will collapse, that's one reason. The other is that if there is an alternative that's much less uh, damaging to well, the, the environment and, and, and our ability to live on the planet. 
Yeah. Right, and I would say long before really the threat to the environment is there, uh, the threat for most people <laughs> is already here. That would be really the reason to... And maybe that's a good point because, you know, really I'm not worried about the sustainability of the system, about whether it's going to collapse or not. Yeah. Really, the idea is to point out the antagonism between these people's, most people's material interests and the very proper and successful functioning of the system when it's functioning at its best. That's really the, the antagonism that needs to be grasped. I think the man getting beer wanted to say... Oh, you go ahead. You wanted to say something for... Yeah, 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 I wanted to ask you a question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't even bring me a beer. Uh, you want a beer? No, I'm fine. No, 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 I'm just kidding. It's a bad joke. Um, you stated a lot of problems with the cat system. Yeah. Did you have a solution? Um, yes and no. <laughs> I said a little something to the, the gentleman sitting over there. What am I doing actually tonight? What am I doing here? Clearly I have certain critiques of the system. They're radical critiques. I think that most of the phenomenon that most people complain about, yeah, um, poverty, environmental destruction, overwork, etc. They're not due to greed, certain people's greed, but to the principle of this economy. Yeah? The subordination of people's livelihood, the subordination of production of goods, of consumption, to the purpose of turning money into more money. That's based on a system of widespread exclusion, and Marx also used the term exploitation. People can only learn a livelihood if they produce more than what... Uh, than if they're, if they're uh, deprived of a certain portion of their product. Only if they produce profits. Only then can they live. And they're useful for others to the degree that they earn a little and work a lot. But okay. you're ignoring like, donation and altruism? Um, Isn't that a part of it also? Maybe I'm just trying to make it not so black and white. Certainly it's not black and white. Certainly there is something like altruism. What's the problem with altruism? Um, altruism first of all, it doesn't change anything about these reasons for poverty. It doesn't remove the antagonist, it doesn't remove the exclusion of people from the wealth they need, nor does it change the purpose of production, nor does it change the fact that people's livelihood are a cost factor for producers, nor does it change the fact that, if they, don't, um, that they are useful for producers to the degree that they earn a little and work a lot. None of that has changed. Altruism is a way of, let's say, not changing that, but dealing with the necessary consequences of that. Let's say the most generous thing I could say about it is that um, it doesn't get to the, let's say, it's a nice medical phenomenon. It treats the symptoms, but it doesn't treat the disease. In that sense, I would say, no, altruism, altruism is not an alternative. In fact, I think there's plenty of goodwill out there. Every every Christmas that comes around there's tons of different organizations that you can donate to I even read a book how the charity industry is now one of the biggest industries there's plenty of goodwill there's plenty of people out there doing good things and yet nothing is changing I think I know why the reason why is because they're not let's say curing the disease which is the very nature of the wealth of the wealth in the society the very purpose for which it's produced that's why I don't want to say that altruism doesn't change anything that it doesn't help at all, but I would say that it's not going after the problem, or the, the source of the problem. Would you say the living standards have increased or decreased all over the world in like the last fifty years? Um, like, like, like the living standards for, for for people all over the world, like generally, just would you say that it's generally increased the living standards or decreased? Um, wh well. First of all, it depends on where you look. Yeah. Lots of places have gotten much poorer than they were ever before. So 1990, Russia went from a second world country to a third world country. Um, standards of living have been falling in the first world for a good time now. Um, in other third world countries, they're rising. But um, what, what, what do you want to say about that? I mean, I could say yes in some places, no in other places. Um, I just want to... I mean, I don't. I don't have a solution. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know what uh, what um, the 
solution could be. Um, but I, I just don't think that uh, there's like this evil force just doing evil. Except, I mean, if you, I think maybe it's just humans being human and humans exploit each other and humans help each other sometimes. And uh, uh, of course, uh, I mean, I don't see like it's not either moral or amoral, but uh, um, but sometimes people just don't. Uh, maybe they don't, don't consider what you're thinking so much. So people are not as smart as you, and perhaps uh, <laughs> that's why they are acting stupid sometimes. Um, I, I don't want to say anything about whether they're as smart as me or stupid as me. <laughs> um, but I would, would say one thing you pointed out. You said maybe people haven't thought about what you're thinking about. Maybe people don't know what you know. Now, it's, actually, I'm certain of that. I don't think that makes me smart. I don't really care about that. But it's true that I do know that and other people don't know that. So what's, what's my solution? Well, to make sure that other people know that. So you do things like organize a talk and go and try to agitate people. Well, why? My conviction is insight into the causes of the problem. That's first, that is the, the best means for finding the solution. Yeah, if there's millions and millions of people who think the same way I do. Well, there's no problem. <laughs> the problem is nobody thinks that way. That's why my solution is not, let's say, to paint a pretty picture for you, how it could look in another world, but to, first of all, convince you. You say, you don't know the solution. My purpose would be to convince you that the, the causes for these problems that I've been talking about are the true causes. That'd be the debate that we should be having. Um, you, and then you over there. <laughs> Um, well, first, thanks very much for a uh, really compelling presentation. And the last point you made, that said, the last point you made, I'd like to push, push you on a bit, which is about, you said about, you went back to causality again, mm -hmm. and what are the causes? And in, in the answers you've given to some of the other questions, um, I want to be more clear about what you think the cause is, because one moment is private property, mm -hmm. and another moment is private ownership and means of production, and then there's the price system, and which, which of them is it? I mean, we had private property, and we had, a, we had a price system in feudalism before capitalism, medieval mm -hmm. feudalism had private property and mm -hmm. had, had prices. What it didn't have was private ownership of the means of production mm -hmm. in the form of capital. Mm -hmm. So is it that? And do you, do you then think causality, because it seems like you're suggesting causality rests in the legal system, mm -hmm. and then... Other people here are very reluctant to say, well, it's something to do with companies because they're, they're being, being greedy. Mm -hmm. um, and we don't want to blame consumers. So, I mean, what's left? <laughs> what? Maybe the point is not to find people to blame. I mean, um, more, more, you know, give me a pen. Yeah. Yeah. The, the question then is one to do with agency and structure as well, of course. I mean, you write for a Marxist, some of you said you write for a Marxist. Um, Magazine, so I'm guessing you're more of a structuralist, but, but can you please be more specific about what it is in the structure which is key and which can be changed? Um, well, maybe I could be more specific about maybe I, what I think you might mean by structural. I'm not sure exactly what you mean by structuralist. Well, if it's not, if it's not the individual companies mm -hmm. and their desires to maximize profits particularly, if the causality rests somewhere else, it's not individual consumers wanting to be, um, mm -hmm. to consume too much, then it must be something structural, which is to do with, you know, the institutional setup and how these fit together. Well, what is it? That. Um, first of all, you started off by saying, which is it? Is it private property? Is it private ownership and the means of production? Or is it the legal system? Uh, to be more specific, I would say it's all three. How do they fit together? First of all, private property. What does that mean? Yeah. Private property means everything that exists, all the wealth society, belongs to somebody. Yeah? Regardless if you need it or not, if you don't own it, it already belongs to someone else, you don't get it. Unless you can pay them a certain sum of money. So... Private property is, first of all, a form of wealth, which means exclusion of other people from wealth. 
Okay. Like you said, a feudal system. They had private property, but not private ownership of the means of production. Yeah. First of all, if private property means anything, well, let's say anything you own, other people are excluded from it. Everything other people own, you're excluded from that. Yeah. That's a very antagonistic economic system. Yeah, that's not a system in which people cooperate in order to produce things that they need. Yeah. And do the organ uh, necessary organizational labor to make that happen. Yeah, that's a system where everybody produces in contradiction to the other. Try to get as high as price as possible. Try to, uh, sorry, get a highest price as possible. Pay as low a price as possible. Yeah, that's a system of antagonisms. I don't think that's a rational system of production. Private ownership of the means of production. Yeah, that's really capitalism. Not only am I excluded from the stuff other people have, but most people are excluded from the means to produce things at all. Private owned the means of production is that a whole group of people can't live at all unless they're useful for other people's production. Yeah? And their purpose is not to satisfy this or that need, but to acquire the means with which you can get a hold of everything. And that's money. It's private ownership of the means of production. Well, what about the legal system? He said, how does that relate? Yeah. The legal system, I would say, the state law, yeah, the law that a state power enforces, that's the entire basis of private property. This economic fact, private property, people are excluded from other things. That's a relation of force. That's not something that some guy can uphold with, uh, by being strong or having a gun. Yeah, the system of private property is only something that uh, can work on the basis of, uh, let's say, widespread, omnipresent state power enforcing that law. So uh, that would be my very brief introduction to <laughs> how private property capitalism and the state uh, fit together. That would be the structural idea. I'm not sure if that's very helpful for the others, but um, to give you an idea of the, let's say, the fundamental nature of my critique. Uh, there was something over here. Yeah, I would like to ask, does it find that the production system in general is the producing a lot of the products you don't need, but that is very general, because don't you think that the, people, that the human has a part of the like, innovation we invented the wheel for some reason? Mm -hmm. of years ago. So instead of we are producing new products, we have a um, will to innovate and will to find new products. And the companies have an opportunity to free the minds that have the um, um, capacity to be creative, um, which um, capitalism gives an opportunity to do in the private ownership of in, in an example for I think that your speech is, I don't know if you have a copyright to it, but um, it, it would be Chance to think is a private property. So uh, I think that the innovation that you describe only to make money is mm. also um, uh, a part of being human. Or do you think that all the new products we are making, like a windmill that we make a lot of money in Denmark, or meditation, is only to make money? I think it pays for our health care system, it pays, pays for hospitals. Um, the windmills pay for the hospitals? Yeah. Okay. Um, let me start with this last point. Um, windmills paying for the hospitals. It, clearly, the, the income that comes from yeah. the money made by the yeah, windmills. Have, of course, it comes from some ideas um, produced by a uh, part of the society, but it, it serves a general purpose for all of society. Yeah. Um, think about this point. The, you point out that, uh, let's think about it this way. Because of the revenue that's generated by innovation, these windmills, yeah. yeah, bring in revenue. This allows people to get access to medical service, which they would otherwise not have. Yeah, otherwise they wouldn't be able to afford medical service at all. If you didn't have these windmills generating revenue, people wouldn't have the money in order to get hold of uh, um, medical services. Yeah. Well, the problem is the solution for which, or let's say, the problem for which money is a solution. Yeah. People otherwise wouldn't be able to pay for medical care. That's a problem that only exists in a society with money. But still, the, the possibility that, all, that all of us don't have to go in the field and produce something to eat. Uh, no, uh, finish that point. Go ahead. Yeah. No, I think you have a lot of uh, very interesting points. Yeah. That's what I was thinking of when I heard the speech that the, the power of innovation and 
or that, that people want some recognition and you get some recognition from your ideas by mm -hmm. getting some coverage to them or being paid for them in some way. Um. So if you, uh, I think that's just a, a human nature. So, of course, if you don't want any monetary system at all in society, you yeah. might help. Oh, yeah. It's just a commentary to, to the innovation part of the speech that I have, of course, to general. Okay, well, let's, let's think about that, that point on innovation. Um, certainly what I wouldn't criticize is something like innovation. If the meaning is developing, let's say, newer, more effective products, yeah? Goods that are, let's say, good for satisfying needs in a more effect, efficient way. Yeah? The thing is, is that um, in our economy, that's not the purpose of innovation. Okay. Okay. Um, I think biotech firms, uh, the, the movement of firms innovating into the green tech industries, uh, produce start producing cash also for the shareholders mm -hmm. and produce some green energy. I think. Well, certainly, there's lots of innovations you could point to that are incredibly useful. Yeah. Um, I don't want to make a judgment about the intentions, certainly not of the scientists yeah, themselves who are coming up with these innovations. Well, of course, I have an intention of, of creating one. They're shareholders. Yeah. Yeah. And, and maybe that's the same point is that your argument is that, look, their general motivation is, of course, to satisfy the shareholders. Yeah. So, but of course, they're also. Well, that allows, or that generates, let's say, the money needed to bring about great ideas which eventually help people. Yeah. But again, the problem that shareholders solve, let's say venture capital solves, is a problem that only exists in a society in which everything is made dependent upon having and earning money. Mm. Otherwise, there's no problem. Think about it this way. If companies didn't earn money, or let's say if companies couldn't um, have intellectual private property, if companies couldn't earn money for the innovations that they bring about, then they wouldn't innovate. Therefore, money allows them to innovate. Well, this whole problem only comes about because nothing is done unless it, or nothing can get done unless it's useful for making profits. Because the means to innovate at all, or to turn innovative ideas into reality, the means to make that transition yeah, from idea to reality, that's all in the hands of capitalists. That's what it means to own the means of production. Because that's the case, yeah, because they have a monopoly on these means, nothing gets done unless they make money. And really what that means is the subordination of innovation, the subordination not only of needs but of innovative products to that purpose. The consequence of that is lots of innovations that never come about. They would be really, really useful. Um, Think of lots of different kind of diseases for which no research is done. One example. Lots of innovative products that uh, could produce things you know, very, very efficiently, but people who don't have the money to pay for it don't get a hold of the innovation. So the system where there's shareholders, but not only shareholders, let's take companies without shareholders. Because these capitalists own the means of production, innovation is supported to their needs. Because that's the case, it's wrong to say money is the motor of these innovations. Money allows these innovations to take place. No, it's just the other way around. These innovations are subordinated to money making. The only reason that intellectual property, the promise of a profit, generates this innovation is because everything's subordinated to profit making anyway. Again, it's a problem, or um, it's a solution to a problem that only this economy has. And so, so it shouldn't be praised for that. <laughs> Okay. Not saying that it's the best system, of course. But it's not the best, um, well, but, or maybe the best, but not a great yeah. uh, system. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm going to get to the gentleman behind you. The same reason why you have never heard about the, a 
research like uh, post scarcity economics because you cannot earn money on researching post scarcity economics, of course. Uh -huh. You can only earn money on researching ways to uh, fight prices. Um, it could be that I haven't heard of post scarcity economics because I'm a lazy researcher. <laughs> it could also be that. Yeah, it's a research, but you can't money researching uh, economics that, that uh, would, would mean that that can't be no prices. No. Because in post scarcity, you can't have prices. Hmm. Right. But that's because the academic system is part of the educational setup, which reproduces the ideas, which makes capitalism yes. seem legitimate. Yes. So it's a, you know, we shouldn't be surprised about this, really. No. <laughs> um, I'm, I might be repeating myself, but one last point about this. Um, if I understood you properly, you said, The money incentive, yeah, is really what allows innovation in the first place. Without, first of all, excluding people from the things that they need, excluding people from the results of innovation, thereby allowing people to make money on it, there would be no innovation in the first place. I would say that's just not, first of all, this is not true. Why should you need that for innovation? Why should you need, why should you need such a contradictory thing? the exclusion of people from a certain product in order to bring about the product. How is that a natural thing? I haven't been thinking of it as thoroughly as you have, but it was just my thought about innovation. It was, it was very interesting to, to hear your point of view because I was just thinking that you were to sell. But of course, it's not fair to exclude people and can agree upon that. Well, well, it's not really a matter of fairness. And... Um, Again, I, I don't want to get at the bad intentions of, of a certain capitalist. I don't really care what they think. Um, I mean, what they think about the innovations they do. In, in fact, I'm certain that you know, scientists, even companies, think that they're providing a great benefit for mankind. And it is often the case that a lot of products that they produce certainly help a lot of people. The, the issue I want to get at is that I keep using this phrase. Yeah? The, let's say the problem which innovation solves yeah, let's say, people not being able to afford medical services, now they're all of a sudden cheap. Yeah? Um, African children starving, or let's say dying of AIDS in the third world, even though it would be so cheap to cure them, now, once you have innovative products that can be, let's say, produced very cheap, they can get a hold of these products. All of these benefits are based on this basic exclusion. And this basic exclusion is not a matter of whether it's fair or not, or whether it's ethical or not. What I want to say is that that, that basic, basic exclusion from the people think from the things people need, that's the foundation of this kind of wealth of private property. That's what ownership, private ownership, means: exclusion of others from these things. As, yeah. So a patent only runs for some time. A what? What did you say? Well, you take patent. A patent. patent yeah. Sorry, sorry. It only runs for some time. So the the money invested by the company have some years to make this up in, and then mm -hmm. you have to make it free for your boss. Uh, no, the goods don't have to be free. <laughs> the, um, that doesn't make no, the, the goods, goods free. But, but, yeah. but the idea is so, so you can do things really cheap. Um, yes. Um, that doesn't change the principle. Certainly. It's true that uh, this knowledge then once again becomes general becomes general knowledge, it's no longer the one company that's allowed to make use of that knowledge, all other companies are able to make use of that knowledge. That doesn't mean that the people get a hold of the products. <laughs> Often it's a, it's a basis for more competition where people can get a hold of them, it doesn't change anything about their exclusion. They have to satisfy another's company's, uh, uh, another's company's profits in order to get a hold of those goods. The second thing is, is that that really underlines that point. Um, why is there something like intellectual property? Knowledge, yeah, technical knowledge, scientific knowledge, is something inherently communist. <laughs> Why? Because it doesn't cost a share. If I know something and tell you about it, it doesn't cost me anything, it doesn't cost you anything, it's a non-scarce resource. 
Yeah? So that's exactly the problem with knowledge in capitalism. That's exactly why uh, you have to have intellectual property here. Why? Because otherwise you wouldn't have the exclusion that you need in order to get a price for it. That's why I would say it's not a good thing that the patents all of a sudden, let's say, run out, yeah, that other people can get a hold of it. First of all, because people are still excluded from it. Second of all, because it really underlines this fact. Yeah. You really need to create a system of exclusion of knowledge, let's say, to generate artificial scarcity, yeah, so that it's useful. Yeah, that's the condemnation of the system. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and that's the leverage you need in order to make money on it. That's actually a very nice example of the principle we're talking about. Anything else? Yeah, go ahead. I think one, one small point about uh, this group uh, saying that, uh, that uh, one idea is that uh, a price is not a from about this. Uh -huh. I'm not sorry to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, country uh, of that, uh, that has uh, four wars everywhere are uh, taking a uh, profit from wars. Uh -huh. The wars itself is, is, is the main industry that keeps the prices alive. I guess I would agree to you to in one point at that. Let's say without permanent, this would be a point that we'd have to talk about in more detail. But I'll, let's say I'll say it as a as a claim, yeah, as a statement. Yeah, it's something I said about this legal system. Yeah. The basis of this economic form of wealth, private property, yeah, is ubiquitous, omnipresent state force. Yeah, yeah this this. This establishment of the law, the establishment of this fact that if you don't own it, you don't get a hold of it. If you want to get a hold of it, you have to pay money. Yeah, that only works on the basis of omnipresent state force. Yeah, that's the one thing. The second thing is this whole thing, price system, yeah, system of private property. It's not only an economic issue. It's like the, the gentleman said before, it is a political issue. It's a political issue in the sense that this economic system is also the basis for a form of state rule, a form of state power. Modern state powers draw their resources from exactly this kind of an economy. And in order for that to work out, in order to, let's say, harness a capitalist system for the purposes of state power, America makes very clear, without a global system of control, yeah, without a, let's say, a level of power to be able to obligate all other countries to subordinate their say, the livelihood of their citizens, the livelihood of their people. Without a state power that forces other state powers to subordinate everything in the market economy, then it's apparently, for America, not a reliable source of state power. Now, in that sense, one could say the whole system functions only on the basis of the permanent readiness for war, and it's also a reason for war. But again, this is, this is my statement, not so much a, an explanation. Maybe we could talk about that in a different talk. <laughs> I'm open for invitations. <laughs> um, you said that like, sharing knowledge between scientists was like a communist thing, or what? I did I get it right? Or? Um, I got I can, like, but, but I think like there's a lot of economy in that, because uh, if you retain knowledge as a scientist, you can gain fame. And fame and street respect is really important for scientists. So, so you you have like a scarcity issue also in science. So I don't think like it's all altruistic in science. Oh no, 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 no. <laughs> certainly not. Uh, the point I didn't want to talk so much about scientists, but really to make a joke about, and it's a true joke about the nature of knowledge that 
knowledge, let's say actual, yeah, knowledge, not so much those who know, but the knowledge itself. It's something, it's a, a, a non-exclusive resource. Yeah. If more, the more people have it, it doesn't take away from the others. And again, that's the, the very irrational thing about this economic system. That's precisely the problem with knowledge. Therefore, in order to be able to make that into a commodity, in order to make it into something that's useful for the purposes that do dominate here, which would be to turn money into more money, the first thing you need to do is be able to exclude others from that knowledge. Again, it's a, an especially drastic illustration, maybe, of this principle. 